Whoa, it's getting stormy around here. Somebody help me out. I'm so afraid. Oh, here comes the waves. Help me. Run away, run away. Oh, my goodness. It's rough around here. Whoa. I'm blowing all over. Whoa. What do you think's going on? Is it tornado? Is it? Is it something else? What do you think it is? It's a hurricane. These are at the, you can tell these are at the coast. These palm trees, the wind's blowing, the rain's blowing so hard. It's a hurricane. Whoa. They can do some damage, can't they? Well, there's a reason we started that way. It's because our story today is about a hurricane. And so this is kind of a different week. We've got um, two small stories we're going to read this week. So since we're not in school tomorrow, we're going to do the first one today. It's about a hurricane. And then, of course, you've got your If I Ran for President story you just listened to also. And you can take an AR test on it. Today we're going to read about a, a, a hurricane that hit Galveston, Texas in 1900. And so, you know, what would it be like to be in a hurricane? One of the things we've been talking about is visualizing when we read <laughs> that little YouTube video of the hurricane that I was just inside of. That helps us visualize for sure, doesn't it? When we visualize, we use our senses to create pictures in our mind as we read. And that video, uh, the pictures were already there, but you could imagine using your mind, if you were there, what would it feel like to have that rain beating down on you and the wind blowing so hard? It blows roofs off of buildings and it would be scary, wouldn't it? When we read a story, we try to visualize it because we don't have a YouTube video. So in our stories, as we read the text, we ask ourselves some questions so we can visualize what's happening. What do I see in my mind? What would I smell? What would I hear? What would I taste? And what would I feel? If I was in those hurricanes for real, like I was like the, on, the, on the video a minute ago, we would feel the cold rain. It might even sting hitting us because the, the wind's blowing so hard. We'd feel the wind blowing us. We'd feel like we're going to be blown off of balance. What would we taste? We might taste some salt water. That salt water from the ocean blowing up and getting in the wind it might taste salty. What would we hear? Definitely wind blowing, waves crashing. What would I smell? You know what the beaches smell like with the saltwater ocean and the sand we would smell the salty ocean and what would we see in our mind well if we're reading we see it we see those things in our mind uh, the pictures we just saw in the videos so as we go through our story in just a few minutes try to visualize in your mind the things that you would see smell hear taste and feel Let's talk about hurricanes for just a minute. What are hurricanes? I'm just going to shrink myself down. Hurricanes are intense tropical storms. As the storms travel over areas such as the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean Sea, they build up heat and energy from warm ocean currents. These tropical storms are powered by winds over 74 miles per hour. The winds rotate around the eye or the center of the hurricane. So you can see the eye is right here. And those winds just whoo, or swirl around it. The winds rotate around the eye. When the hurricanes hit land, they bring heavy rain, strong winds, and damaging buildings and land like we just saw in that video. This photo shows a hurricane from far above Earth. The eye is visible at the center. So a lot of hurricanes hit the Gulf of Mexico. Just last week, one hit around New Orleans. And then uh, also... Sometimes they'll come on the East Coast, maybe Florida or um, South Carolina, th that area, Georgia, around that area right there. They'll hit there. But we get hurricanes a lot of times in the United States in September and sometimes October, like we did uh, this year. So hurricanes, they can be pretty rough. That's what our story is about this week. There's three words I want you to see for our story um, today. Just make sure you understand and know these words. The first one is surge surge 
If there's a surge of water, there's a sudden large increase in its depth. During hurricanes, people use sandbags to protect their homes from a water surge. So what do you think brings that surge of water in? Maybe the wind and just this, the rough sea and the water comes in so much farther than it usually does. Sometimes it covers the whole city street in an ocean town like Myrtle Beach or somewhere like that because of the surge of water. Sometimes people perish. When people or animals perish, they die. That's sad, isn't it? But that happens in hurricanes. People perished in the hurricane. That means they died in the hurricane. This word looks like debris, but it's debris. Debris is the pieces of something that was broken or destroyed. So debris, um, if you imagine the roof blowing off that building like we saw, the pieces of the roof laying all around would be the debris. Homes can be destroyed by a hurricane or a tornado, leaving debris scattered all around. So remember when we see this word, it's not debris, but it's debris. Okay, let's look at our story. Now, our genre for this story called the Galveston Hurricane of 1900, our genre is narrative nonfiction. And I want you to go ahead and open up your books to page 190. 190, I want you to follow along with me as I read it today. It's narrative nonfiction. And narrative nonfiction gives factual information by telling a true story about people, places, or events. Personal narratives tell about an important event in a real person's life. So you remember our first, maybe the third or fourth week of school, you turned in your personal narratives about something that an experience you had that made you who you are today, an important event in your life. Well, this is a narrative nonfiction. And so it's a true story that it affected people, places, or events. Okay. Authors of narrative nonfiction and personal narratives present events in sequential or chronological order. What do you think those two words mean? There's some context clues, right? They put present the events in, let's just skip over here to order. So what do you think sequential and chronological mean? Well, have you heard the word sequence? Putting things in the right sequence. Mm -hmm. And uh, chronological means like number order. So all the events are going to be described to us in order, in the order that they happened. Narrative nonfiction tells about events from the past. Events are told from a secondhand point of view. And personal narratives give a firsthand account about an experience. What do you think a narrative nonfiction tell about events from the past? Why would that need to be? But you can't tell about things from the future for sure. But can you write a story about something that's happening right now? Not if you're going to tell the whole story because you don't know how it ends. So narrative nonfictions tell about events from the past because they know how the story ends. And they're told from a secondhand point of view, like somebody watching it, who watched it happen or heard about it happening. A firsthand account is, I'm telling you what happened to me. It didn't, I didn't watch it happen to somebody else. I'm telling what happened to me. Okay, let's move on and get into our story. The Galveston Hurricane of 1900. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of my drink so I don't get coughing while we're reading. There we go. These allergies got my throat tickly. All right. In 1900, Galveston, Texas was a busy commercial port. We've learned in social studies, uh, the port, it's like the port of New Orleans where the ships would go out into the ocean. It was also a popular place to vacation. The city set just along the Gulf of Mexico. Warm waters lapped along its beaches. It would have been an ideal place to visit at the time, but Galveston was on a barrier island. Barrier islands can slow down storms approaching the mainland. They take the impact of the damaging winds and storm surge that accompanies a hurricane. This was Galveston's fate. A few days before the great storm, scientists predicted a storm's path would go along the east coast of the United States. Unfortunately, for the 38,000 residents of Texas, the storm changed directions on September 8th, 1900. The hurricane struck. The storm's arrival. The ocean swelled 
Waves rose 20 feet within hours. The storm surge easily flooded the island that Galveston called home. Wind speeds grew to 135 miles per hour. It was a Category 4 hurricane, the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. Buildings were shattered from the storm's force. They washed up near other collapsed buildings. People who hid in these structures were crushed. Other people drowned. The storm wiped out entire blocks and destroyed about 3,600 homes. About 8,000 people perished in the storm. Remember what perished means? It means they died. 8,000 people in Galveston, in Galveston, Texas died in the storm. Wow. Milton E. Elford was a young man living in Galveston with his mother, father, and a young nephew. And his nephew was Dwight. Milton was the only member of his family to survive the storm. He described this experience in a letter to his brothers in North Dakota. This portion of his letter begins as the rising water and intensity of the storm persuade the family to leave their home for a sturdier brick house across the street. We left our house about four o'clock, thinking we would be safer in a larger house, not dreaming that even the ha that house would be washed away. We went across the street to find to a fine large house built on a brick foundation high off the ground. About five, it grew worse and began to break up the fence, and the wreckage of other houses was coming against us. Look at the damage here to the houses in Galveston. Approximately 3,600 homes were destroyed, remember? Let's continue with his story. We had it arranged. We had it, we had arranged that if the house showed signs of breaking up, I would take the lead and Pa would come next with Dwight and Ma next. In this way, I could make a safe place to walk as we would have to depend on floating debris for rafts. There were about 15 or 16 in the house besides ourselves. They were confident the house would stand anything. If not for that, we would have probably left on rafts before the house went down. We all gathered in one room. All at once, the house went from its foundation and the water came in waist deep. And we all made a break for the door, but could not get it open. We then smashed out a window and I led the way. I'd only got it part way out when the house fell on us. I was hit on the head with something and it knocked me out and into the water head first. I do not know how long I was down, as I must have been stunned. I came up and got hold of some wreckage on the other side of the house. I could see one man on some wreckage to my left and another on my right. I went back to the door that we could not open. It was broke in and I could go part way in. As one side of the ceiling was not within four or five feet, I think of water. There was not a thing in sight. I went back and got on the other side, but no one ever came up that I could see. We must all have gone down the same time, but I cannot tell why they did not come up. And then I and then started to leave. I start then started to leave by partly running and swimming from one lot of debris to the other. The street was full of tops and sides of houses, and the air was full of flying boards. I think I gained about a block on the debris in this way, and got in the shelter of some buildings. But they were going; they were fast going down, and I was afraid of getting buried. Just then, the part I was on started down the street, and I stuck my head and shoulders in an old tool chest that was lying in the debris that I was on. I could hardly hold this down on its side from being blown away, but that's what saved my life again. When the water went down about 3 a.m., I was about five blocks from where I had started. My head was bruised and legs and hands cut a little, which I did not find until Monday, and then I could hardly get my hat on. As soon as it was light enough, I went back to the location of the house and not a sign of it could be found and not a sign of any house within two blocks where before there was scarcely a vacant lot. Pretty sad, huh? That would be terrifying, wouldn't it, to be like him and be inside a house that collapsed and knocks you under the water and you come up and you're trying to find a piece of wood or something to float on and you're looking for... The, your family, and they never come up from under the water? How sad. After the storm. The storm passed in the early morning hours of the next day. The residents of Galveston began the task of cleaning up the wreckage and rebuilding the city. These efforts included raising the buildings up to 17 feet 
by pumping sand beneath the foundations. A sturdy seawall was built along the ocean front, but what was once the busiest seaport in Texas was changed forever. The devastating storm convinced shippers to move north to Houston. It took over a decade for Galveston to fully rebuild and become the thriving city it once was. All right, let's talk about this story for just a minute. Why weren't the people of Galveston prepared for the hurricane? Do you remember why? It says reread page 192. Let's go back and find our evidence in the text. Whoops. Okay, so it's in this paragraph right here. See if you can see it. Why weren't Gal? Why was Galveston not prepared? Did you find it? It's because a few days before the storm, scientists predicted the storm's path would go along the east coast of the United States. So scientists said it wouldn't hit Galveston. It would go along the east coast. So there's that answer. And what details show that the Elford family's plan to go to the house across the street made sense? So back on page 193. Okay, so we left our house about four o'clock thinking we would be safer in a larger house. Okay, so that, not dreaming that it, the house would be washed away. So it was on a brick foundation high off the ground. So those things, they were in a larger house. They didn't think it would be washed away because it was on a brick foundation. It was high off the ground, but it didn't work, did it? Unfortunately, that house came crashing down too. And how is the information in each account of the hurricane similar? And how is it different? Well, Ms. Mr. Uh, what's their names? What's their family name? I forgot his name. Elford. Mr. Elford's is a personal account, isn't it? It's a first-hand account like we talked about a minute ago. His information is what happened to him. It's personal, a first-hand account. The other part of the story that's not him telling the story is a second-hand account. It's just giving facts about the story. And that's how, but they're both given facts about the storm, about the hurricane, just in different ways. All right. So interesting story, a sad story this week. But remember, our theme for this module that we're on is rise to the occasion. So we're talking about hard things that happen in life and how we have to rise to the occasion and make the most of it. So that's how life is. Sometimes hard storms come, both literally and physically. Uh, Literally and, and uh, figuratively, um, storms can sometimes come in the way of getting a bad cold or maybe somebody in your family gets sick or a pet dies. That's things like that. So we rise to the occasion and we just move on and we, we show strength and courage and we move on. Speaking of moving on, let's move on to our decoding for this week. So these words that we're going to be working with in spelling this week have these two sounds, the O-U and the, this O with a kind of a pointy thing on top. And so here's how I like to remember these sounds. The O-U says, ow, like somebody pinched you. Say, ow. And this O is like when, when Bella Lowe sees a cute boy. She says, aw, aw. <laughs> okay, so ow and aw. So let's see if we can figure out which one is which. The O-U, that owl sound, can be spelled as O-U or O-W. The all sound can be spelled as A-U, A-W, or just an A. So let's try to listen to these words and see if it's the owl or the all sound. <laughs> Number one is count. That's the owl sound, right? And it's spelled with the O-U pattern. Second word Howl, howl, owl. It's the O-U sound spelled with the O-W pattern. Oh, it's a little fawn. That's the aw sound. Aw, A-W pattern. Halt. That's the aw sound with an A. Launch. Aw, that's the A-U sound. with. I mean, that's the aw sound with the A-U pattern. Couch, owl. O-U pattern, palm, ah, it's just the A again, 
bounce, the owl sound with the OU pattern. Straw, the aw sound with the AW pattern. Crown, owl with an OW pattern. Stalk, aw with an A pattern. Flaw, aw with an AW pattern. Sow, owl, sour, oh, the owl sound with the OU pattern. Town, owl with an OW. Laundry, aw, AU pattern. Sorry if I'm getting on your nerves. Grouch, <laughs> owl with the OU pattern. Crowd, owl with the OW pattern. Also, aw with the A pattern. Gnaw, aw with an AW pattern. Mouse, owl with an OU pattern. Cause, aw with an AU pattern. Down, owl with an OW pattern. Foul, owl with an OU pattern. Shawl, aw with an AW pattern. Scout, owl with an OU pattern. So, all of the words that are in our spelling list this week are going to have these owl sound or the all sound. Let's look at this sentence down here on number six. Can you find words that have that all sound? See any? How about small? That's the all sound with the A pattern. Does that say all or all? No, it would be call. That's a cat. It's a short A. How about the owl sound? You see some owl words? I see three owl words in this sentence. Me, owl. <laughs> owl with the OW pattern. Pouncing. Owl with the OU pattern. And mouse. Owl with the OU pattern. Well, let's take a look at our spelling words now. And so all these words have that owl and all pattern, pattern in them. So you'll need to be careful about how the pattern is spelled in each one of these words. So let's just go through these words and I'll say them. You need to pause the video and write these words down at some point so that you can study them for this week. Okay. I have a spelling test on Friday with these words. Here we go. Allowed. Bald. Hawk. South, faucet, proud, claw, tower, stalk, couple, howl, false, dawn, allow, drown, pause, fault, cause. Amount, cloudier, author, sprawl, ounce, and coward. So I read a word that I'm surprised it's on this list. Did you see a word or hear a word as I read them that does not have the owl or the all sound? There certainly is one in our list that does not. What's this word right here? Is it culpable? Cowpool? No, it's couple. Oh, oh, I guess call a loud, a loud cowpool. No, owl. It's not the owl. All cowpool. I don't think that's either one of those patterns. I don't say cowpool and I don't say cowpool. Uh, that's uh, like a short U sound. Uh, uh, couple. Well, it's in the list anyway. Make sure you know how to spell it. <laughs> okay, now um, you can go back and take an AR test on your story if I ran for president. Get you some points today. Also, in the next two slides, the first one is a short little lesson on present progressive verbs. Present progressive verb sounds hard. It's not. If I ask you a question, what are you doing? You would answer with a present, a present progressive verb. You would say, I am learning. Am learning is present progressive. It's just putting an ing on the verb and a helping verb before it. Am learning. Am playing. If it was past, it would be was learning, was playing. 
So you'll see a quick lesson on on that. And then the last slide is a silly little video of some pumpkins having a conversation. And uh, it's full of present progressive um, verbs. So listen to it. And the only thing you have to do for that today, you don't have to turn it in. Try to jot down at least five present progressive verbs you hear from the last the video on the last slide. OK, have a great day. Enjoy your day off tomorrow. Go vote with your parents so you can see what it's like. And we'll talk to you on Wednesday.